passionately to this cause. He knew why he came and he died for this particular cause. So we pray in this Mass for the grace that he needs to carry on the mission that God has given us as Franciscans, SVDs, Martinists, <coughs> and other congregations gathered here. So we, as we prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries, let us now call to mind our sins and ask God for pardon and mercy. <coughs>
giver of every good gift, put into our hearts the love of your name, so that by deepening our sense of reverence, you may nurture in us what is good, and by your watchful care, keep safe what you have nurtured. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Synagogue worship. 
Because in the synagogue, what the Jews did, were some of the things that they did were things like reading from the Shema. <coughs> Hear, O Israel. They would proclaim that. At the same time, they would also chant psalms. Apart from that, they would also read from the Pentateuch, the five books <coughs> of Moses. Furthermore, they would read now from the prophets, and afterwards, they would conclude with the blessing of Aaron from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24. But notice what happens. Before the final blessing, there is chaos in the synagogue. The scales, like when you have mass sometimes, I hope that it won't happen in mass. Before the final blessing, chaos sets in because they were supposed to receive a blessing. <coughs> Jesus does not finish his mission in the synagogue yet. He has already proclaimed and inaugurated the reign of God. He skips deliberately the books of the law. He goes straight to the book of Isaiah from the prophets and he proclaims what Isaiah proclaims. Jesus is inaugurating the kingdom of God, the reign of God. And that for him was very crucial because he had to do this at the beginning of his ministry, without which was going to be very difficult to carry out his mission. And he knew it was a very strategic plan that he made that this would take place within the setting of the synagogue. What began with admiration Acclaim and praise sours into jealousy and suspicion. The Jewish community seemed to be too familiar with this Galilean Jew such that they could not see anything that was associated with this kingdom of God. And yet in him, this kingdom of God was burning with passion and with enthusiasm he proclaims it. At the beginning he says, the Spirit of the Lord is anointed me, which means he was a Spirit-filled man. And knowing that he was a Spirit-filled man, Jesus was conscious of himself, who he was, where he was coming from, and where he was going. He was conscious of this. He, he knew, in other words, what his vocation was, to inaugurate the kingdom of God, and we will see from this point onwards how Jesus is going to spend his whole life his whole energy and time proclaiming the kingdom of God. He is going to commit himself to this cause to the point of dying. This is something that I find very fascinating about Jesus, how passionate he was about the reign of God. <coughs> so many times we hear on his lips, the kingdom of God, the reign of God is at hand. What is this kingdom of God? How can we describe it? What is, this, what is it all about? And if this kingdom of God was so crucial to Jesus, is it really making impact on our lives? How influential is it? Dear brothers and sisters, this kingdom of God is already reigning. Because the kingdom of God, as he says, is not there or here, but it is within you and among you. This kingdom of God is Jesus Christ himself, because he is the auto Basileus, the embodiment of this kingdom is his goodness, his divinity, his power, his influence, and his grace and blessing. His whole life becomes for us the kingdom, and the kingdom of God is here and now. When you look at St. Bonaventure, you will see how much it has grown, from the three families to other families around us. The kingdom of God is not static. It continues to grow, and it will continue to grow until God himself returns. The kingdom of God is never static, it is a dynamic force. It will continue growing and influencing us all the time. But the problem is this, when we become too familiar with this kingdom, when we become too familiar, over familiarity, like the Jewish community here, you see, they knew that this man truly, there's something spiritual, there's something great about him, but how is it that he's the son of the carpenter? Where did he get all this wisdom? And after this, when you read the succeeding verses, it is, believed, it is said that they will push him out of the synagogue to the brow of the hill in an attempt to throw him. And I'm sure Jesus must have been traumatized in the month. That was an attempt to kill him. Yet we are told 
that he made his way and he passed through them. This is how Christ committed himself to the kingdom. I think the calling that Jesus presents to us, to you and me today, is that we should commit ourselves to the kingdom of God. And all our studies, everything that we are doing in this place, must lead and direct us towards the kingdom. The kingdom is God's agenda as manifested in the mystery of the person of Jesus Christ, and we all participate in this agenda of God. The kingdom of God is not a private enterprise, no. It is a public one. And we are all called to participate in this kingdom. And how do we participate? It requires preparation. 30 years, he lived a, a very hidden life. And three years, he achieved so much. 30 years, Jesus' life is very hidden. And for three years, he made an impact that no parliament, no politician, no emperor has ever you know, achieved like Jesus achieved. We see him going about now demonstrating this kingdom when he begins to exercise demons, when he begins to preach the parables, when he illustrates the meaning of God's love, and when he demonstrates by his own life and in his own preaching, in his words, he demonstrates what God is like and what it means to love God, what it means to forgive, what it means to be compassionate. He goes out not only to invite sinners, but also he goes out to search for sinners. He mingles with public sinners and tax collectors, and he even goes to the extent of having what Christology experts are saying, the table of fellowship. That is what Jesus is doing. Our part is then to see and study and observe how Jesus is carrying out his mission. Our philosophy that we do here and all the studies that we do in this place, with the help of our lecturers here, all that is to help us in terms of carrying out the mission that Jesus has left to us. We are called to liberate the captives, to give sight to the blind, and to proclaim the truth and the year of favor of the Lord. And how do we do that? We begin from here. Right here at St. Bonaventure, before we even go out, we begin from our communities, right there where we live, in the corridors of the OFM Priory, the, the Capuchin Priory, the Convention Priory, and indeed in the corridors of our own houses for those of us who are coming from outside these walls. That is where the kingdom begins from. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters, we are called to experience first and foremost Jesus, and then we can go out and give something to those people out there. Because there's a saying goes, we cannot give what we don't have. What is the purpose of studying philosophy if all we do is to bring confusion among people? Is there any purpose of studying philosophy? When I know that I can't proclaim the truth, what is the purpose of philosophy if I can't even manage finances of the congregation of the order? What is the purpose of studying philosophy if I can't be trusted, if I can't take care of what I am given to do, if I can't respect the rules and regulations of the church, if I can't live to the full the commitment that I have made? Philosophy must help me to understand, first and foremost, the mystery of the person of Jesus Christ. If I understand him, though we cannot fully understand him because Jesus is a mystery, but we can have a glimpse into this mystery. We can have an insight into this mystery. And when we begin to engage with him, then we will know what he wants us to do. To bring about goodness, to bring about justice, to bring about truth, to bring about love, to preach forgiveness and unity. That is our duty. Today, it is sad at times to see scholars, great people, intelligent enough to tell society what to do, and yet, at times, we realize that they cannot leave their commitment. Why is the church today failing to manage most of the scandals that we have heard? Why is the church today failing to address issues that are very crucial within the, the, the church? If we say we have studied philosophy, theology, all these great studies that we have, then it should translate into how we are doing the aspect of management. It should help us indeed. You know, sometimes it is sad to see 
a young friar or a young religious who is so intelligent, failing to appreciate prayer, failing to appreciate the need for good living, failing to take care of what is entrusted, yet so intelligent. In class,